open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. A few years ago, I preached a full series on all these things, all these things. And last week and this week and maybe one or two more, I'm going back and not re-preaching those, but some of those all these things that I missed uh, back then. So just a kind of a brief mini-series about all these things. Last week we saw returning from the chastening of all these things. If you remember the children of Israel had got away from God and God said, I'm going to bring these chastenings on you, these judgments upon you, and all these things. When those chastenings come, he says, how to come back when God has placed all these things upon you. And we looked about that. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like there's a lot of things falling upon me. And God talked about how to come back from the chastening when God's judgment of all those things come upon us. By the way, God brings all those things in chastening upon us, not because He's an ogre, not because He's a mean God, but because He loves us and chastens us to bring us back to himself. To avoid all those things, we just need to live right and do right. So we saw that last week about coming back from all these things that come upon us. So tonight, we're looking at a very familiar passage, but I'm afraid sometimes, again, as Christians, because we've been in church so long, we've been in the Bible so long, that we miss the wonder of what God has for us. So I'm going to ask you that you listen tonight freshly. In other words, let your mind and heart, like you've never heard it, let your mind and heart, let God speak to you, because this idea we're looking at tonight about overcoming the temptation of all these things. We get to the place sometimes where I'm afraid that we think, well, temptation is just kind of a game. Temptation is not a game. Temptation is not something we can go ahead and just play with. Temptation is one we need to recognize, avoid, and get victory over. And all God's people said... Amen. So I want you to think about even today, the temptation that you may have fallen for, the temptation you succumbed to, uh, maybe yesterday, maybe today, maybe this week, and but with the purpose tonight of learning how to prepare so we do not give in to temptation, because the giving of in to temptation is sin. Now, we know that Christ was tempted, and we'll see this tonight, in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He, had, he experienced the temptation, but did not sin. We need to make sure and understand that when temptation comes, we recognize it as temptation and avoid sin. I'm afraid we, as God's people, we just take sin too lightly in our lives. As long as it's not this big sin, as long as it's not this big thing, uh, that I'm all right with these smaller sins. No, God wants us to avoid all sin. And so we're looking tonight at the temptation of all these things. God gives us a little picture, a little inside look, a little glimpse at the temptation of Christ. And He put it in there so we can know He was tempted in all points like as we are, but also so we can learn how to overcome the temptation of all these things. We know Christ was tempted in three areas, and we'll see it listed here, but we're going to be focusing on that last one primarily where he was tempted with all these things. So here we go. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. 
Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Father, we need some help tonight. I need some help to recognize the great challenge we have with the temptation of all these things around us. So, Lord, I pray that you would stir us new and afresh tonight as your people. Lord, these are good folks. They're here on a Wednesday night in the middle of the week after a long work day. We're still with things yet to do tonight, preparing for tomorrow, losing some sleep maybe tonight as they head in tomorrow because they want to come, magnify you, lift one another up in prayer, and to, to hear from your words. Lord, I pray that, first of all, in my heart and the heart of each one, we would take this thing of temptation seriously. You warn us about that. You challenge us about that. So, Lord, I pray that we, again, our hearts would be set so that when we leave from this place, we'll be on guard, we'll be ready to defend ourselves, we'll be ready to fight the temptation to keep us from sin, that we might be the vessels that you have for us. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. That little expression there in verse number 9, where Satan is speaking to, the, to Christ, and he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Boy, just thinking that little thought, all these things. Have you felt that way when temptations come? It's just, you just get bombarded with temptation. You just get bombarded with the things of the world. Just all these things. All, so many temptations, so many things attacking us, so many things put around us that draw us away from what we ought to be doing and what we ought to be thinking and how we ought to respond. Again, we don't even recognize most of them. We think, well, it's just kind of a tough day for me or I was, wasn't what I was supposed to be. No, God's got a plan for us. God's got a way for us. God's got a spirit for us. And so we have to put ourselves on guard about this thing of temptation. But he said, all these things... We are exposed and tempted in so many ways, in so many areas throughout the day. Our young people are tempted in so many ways, in so many things, that I know the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun, but I can't help but think right now we are exposed to so much more of all these temptations than ever before. There are just so many, and not only are they many, but we're susceptible to more we're exposed to more all the time because it's accepted by the society so many things that we fall into temptation because the world says it's not so bad some years ago it was Cursing was something you just did not do. Oh, a lot of people may have done it, but it was not approved of. It was not recognized to do. Uh, pornography was not as, as, as rampant as it is today, not as open as it is today. If you were going to watch, uh, see some pornography, you'd have to go down to the drugstore, the inappropriate store, and buy that and purchase it. But now it comes across your television. Now it comes across your, your, your Internet all over. So we just bombarded with the temptations of all these things things. It's offered to us, it's delivered to us, and it's just accepted and readily available everywhere. But here we find Satan coming to Christ and tempting him with all these things. So tonight we're looking at that, mainly that third aspect, that third temptation that the devil gave Christ, tempting him in all these things. By the way, I'm glad we have a Savior who was tempted in all points like as we are. And we need to understand that yet without sin. In fact, let me read this for you. It says there in Hebrews 4.15, and we know this wonderful passage. I preach it and teach it all the time because I need it. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Our goal ought to be yet without sin for ourselves also. Yes, we sometimes, well, I, he was tempted all points like we are, and he didn't have any sin, but I'm tempted and I fall into sin. Our goal ought to be the same way, yet without sin. The temptation to get angry comes in, in an appropriate way, with, but we can hear, have that temptation yet without sin. So we find he yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For our temptations and all these things, we need mercy. 
We need to be seeking. That's what it says. We can obtain mercy. God's help, God's grace to help us in temptation that we will not sin. Our goal every day ought to be, God, help me not to sin. You know your besetting sin. You know I know my besetting sin. When you say, God, help me today in every aspect that I will not sin. You know, we cannot be perfect. We will sin, but we don't have to. So the goal ought to be, Lord, help me not to sin. And so we need mercy in this thing of temptation. We need grace to help in time of temptation. So let's see temptation not as a joke, not as a game, but something as God here is trying to reveal to us to help us. It is a danger. Because when we succumb to temptation, we're falling into sin. And the more we sin, the easier it's going to be to go down that long, long path to destruction. So Jesus is teaching here about this idea of temptation, where he tempted him with all these things. So we're going to start with some basics, and then we're going to get into some deeper things. But again, I'm asking you, listen like it's new. Listen like it's fresh. As you read this, let God speak to your heart. So looking tonight, first of all, number one, the overview of the temptation of all these things. The overview, just the big picture of what we're talking about temptation, what we're talking about the temptation of all these things. Number one, we find the seeds of the temptation. The seeds of the temptation. Where does temptation come from? Where does this drawing out on me come from? Well, the seeds, very quickly. I think you've got it there in James 1, 14. It says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So the first seed we have of where this temptation comes from is ourself. It is ourself. We are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. So though Jesus himself was tempted yet did not sin, he was tempted in his flesh. He was 100% man and 100% God. He had flesh just like you and I do. He got weary. He got uh, discouraged maybe. Well, he wouldn't get discouraged, but he would have that temptation to be discouraged because he is flesh. We have the flesh that we fight all the time. The old man. So the seed of temptation is myself. One of the key areas of where temptation comes from is me. That's why the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, 18 says, For I know that in me, that is my flesh. Now listen, if the Apostle Paul says in his flesh, no good thing, certainly in my flesh there's no good thing, dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me. He said, but I know what I want to do, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Well, the seed of temptation, where does the temptation come from? The seed's in myself, when I'm drawn away of my own lust. Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. It says, I'm not to make provision for my flesh to let it fulfill its lust. The word provision means to care or supply. To care or supply. God reminds us that we're not to supply opportunities for our flesh to sin. We're not to set things in motion, allowing myself to sin. I'm not supposed to put myself in places where I will be tempted to sin. I'm to guard against that. So I'm not to make provision. I'm not to make a way. I'm not to make a supply for sin. So we look at the seed of, sin, of temptation. First of all, it's self. It comes from this old nature, this old nature of mine that I have. Secondly, it comes from Satan. It comes from Satan. If you look in our text there in verse number three, as is when the tempter came to him. The tempter came to him. Satan is the tempter. He's the enticer. We just read that it comes when, I'm, when a man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. He's the enticer. He's going to make sure those circumstances come around us. He's going to make sure that that woman walks past inappropriately dressed. He's going to make sure that we hear that music that's going to take us down the wrong path. He's going to make sure we're going to find ourselves in those conditions. So he is the enticer. Satan comes and he entices us and he tempts us. He is the tempter. He's the enticer. He's our adversary. He's not our friend. He is our enemy, doing everything he can to get you to sin and everything he can to get me to sin as he did everything he could to get Christ to sin. That's why in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, 
as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So Satan, he's not our friend. He's our adversary. And he is working, and his demons are working to tempt us in all these areas, in all these things. Thirdly, we find not just ourself. The seed is not just Satan, but the seed of temptation is society. It's society. It's this old world. It's this world we are in. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. I know people laugh at the old television programs. Uh, Father Knows Best. Uh, Leave it to Beaver. And says, there's no way the world could be like that. Most homes in America were like that. No, they weren't maybe as perfect as that, but the whole idea, those, those struggles and the way they raised their children, the way they had the relationships, it was a good time. But you imagine watching that to the filth that comes now on television even now. Boy, this whole world is a seed. This society, the love of this world, is a seed of temptation. That's why in 1 John 2, 15, love not the world. He said, man, don't love this old world. Neither the things are in the world. If, the, if a man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And for all that is in the world, and he lists those big three we'll see tonight, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we have to understand the world is not our, our friend either. The world is a seed. It's a place where those temptations come from. It's the world society, their attitudes, their approach, their, all those things that come into our life. So we find the overcoming the temptation of all these things, the seeds is myself. That's why I have to crucify the flesh. That's why I have to die daily. That's why I have to guard my eyes and guard my ears and guard my heart because this old nature goes after sin. It goes after those enticements. And then we have Satan, recognize him, and we're to flee him and resist him, and then society itself. Very quickly, notice the scope of temptation. The scope of temptation. We just read it, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but it's lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. All the temptations fall into one of those three categories. That's the scope. But I want you to notice as we look tonight, the sequence of the temptations. The sequence of the temptations. Or the staging of the temptation. Or the swelling of the temptation. As we look at what Jesus was tempted, he was tempted by those three great temptations, the same ones we are, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. He just kept coming. He just kept coming. You know, the devil's not going to let up on you. The devil's not going to let up on me. He didn't let up on Christ. There it says at the end, yes, he left, but the other gospel tells us he departed for a season. In other words, the devil kept coming back to Christ here in this temptation time, but also throughout his ministry, the devil kept coming back and tempting him. How many understand the devil's going to keep coming at you? He's going to keep coming at you. He's not going to let up. He's not going to quit. And he's going to keep stepping it up, raising the pressure, raising the stakes, if you will, in our temptations. He's got many different levels. We find the first one here, we see the lust of the flesh. Where Jesus was hungry and, and Satan said, If thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. He says, Satisfy your flesh. Satisfy that personal need. Satisfy that, that private need. So we have lust of the flesh. That's personal. That's the passion. And that's the private. Those things that want to gratify this physical body. He comes at us with that. He comes at it with you and with me all the time. And if, they, if he can't win there... Or even if he does win there, he cranks it up to number two, the pride of life. That's why he hooked Jesus up there to the top. And he said, if you be the son of God, throw yourself off. Prove yourself. Let everybody see that you are in fact the Messiah. You are in fact the Christ. He said, so it's kind of a, a public display of sin. It's kind of a, a, an issue of pride. The pride of life. He said, throw yourself off and let the world see you. And then we had the lust of the eyes. And that was the third one where he said, all these things. It's global. It's encompassing. It's overwhelming. Look what it says there. Verse number 8, and again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. And this is the one we're focusing on tonight. And showeth him all the kingdoms of the world 
and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee. It's almost like the sum of all desires, both the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, and now the lust of the eyes. It's just covering everything. He said, all these things, all these things, everything you can see, all the things that will satisfy your eyes, all the things that will satisfy your pride, all the things that will satisfy the pride of life. He said, I'll give you all these things. Notice the offering of the temptation of all these things. Are you still with me tonight? I hope you're not just turning off, well, it's just another Bible study. No. Oh, we're in such danger of sin, such danger of temptation. And here we're taking this lesson on how to overcome the temptation of all these things. Notice the offering of the temptation of all these things. He offered him everything. All these things. All the kingdoms and the glory of all these things, you can have it. I want you to notice, first of all, Satan's prize was his worship and service. Satan's prize was the worship and service. What was it Satan wanted? He said, I'll give you all these things in exchange. I'll give you all these things if you. And what his prize was, what he was looking for, was worship and service. Notice what it says in verse number 8. Again, verse number 9, verse number 9, and he saith to him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down, and worship. Satan just said worship. He said, you fall down and worship me and all these things I will give you. But when Jesus answered, verse 10, then said Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Satan just asked for worship. Jesus added, and serve. The reason why, I believe it's have your notes, is who we worship we serve. What we worship, we serve. It's as simple as that. When we put something above God, then we end up serving that more than God. Whatever we worship, whatever we magnify, whatever we give credence to, whatever we give great value to, which worship means adding value or giving value to, recognizing value, that we serve. Over and over, I didn't write them all down, but I took the long list and so on. Over and over and over and over throughout the Old Testament, they worshiped and served. Worshiped and served. Worshiped and served. Over and over, different gods and different people, it was worship and served. Very, very, very seldom did you find when they're talking about idolatry, did they just worship? No, they worshiped and served. It goes together. Worship and serve. So Satan just says, just fall down and worship me. Because he knew that if you could fall down and worship, then he's got your service. If you and I will fall down in idolatry and worship him, we will have our service also. So we can kind of look and see who we're worshiping by who we are serving. Yeah, so Satan's prize. What did he want with all those things? Worship and service. Worship and service. Now, Here's a thought. Here's a statement. Satan is worshipped when we are given to idolatry. Satan is worshipped whenever we are given to idolatry. You say, oh, preacher, I don't have any statues in my house. There's no little fat guys I'm, I'm worshiping over here. There's no little cam camels or, or elephants over here. I don't have grapefruit statues I'm worshiping over here. So I guess I'm all right. No. In Romans 1, 25, God says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served, there it is, you can't escape worship and service together, and worshipped and served, by the way, if you say, well, I'm worshipping God, but you're not serving Him, I begin to wonder whether or not you're really worshipping Him. Throughout the Scriptures, it's worship and serve. But He says, and worshipped and served the creature more than unto Creator. Worshipped and served what class? The creature more than the creator. Worshipped and served the what? Creature more than the creator. Who is the creature? Us. Yeah, we like to think the animals went, no, he's talking about us. The truth of God worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. I am one of those creatures. So whenever I... Worship and serve me more than the Creator, I become an idol. I get involved in idolatry. 
It is me that is doing that. How many times then has Satan tempted us to fall down and worship him, if you will, because we're worshiping the creature more than the creator? Oh, God says that's wicked, that's vile, that is sin, that is the sin of idolatry. So next time the Satan tries to get you to say, why don't you just worship and serve yourself? Don't worry about the Creator, don't worry about God. What do you want to do? What do you want to have? How do you want to live? How do you want to respond to this situation? How do you want to respond to that person? How do you want to spend your money? How do you want to spend your time? You say, no, I'm not going to worship the creature, I'm going to worship the Creator. I'm not going to serve the creature, I'm going to serve the Creator. So whenever we are given to idolatry, it's Satan that's being worshipped. Satan's prize, worship and service. All these things was offered if he would just fall down and worship. Satan's proffer was valid. Satan's proffer was valid. That offer he made was valid for a while. See, what are you talking about? Satan could give Jesus all the kingdoms and the glory in this old world. He could. Because the Bible says, for a while, he's got that authority. In fact, the Bible says, in John 12, 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Right now, he's the prince of this world. He's the ruler of this world. He's got his hands in all the pies. He's ruling everything in this world. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So he is the God of this world. He's the prince of this world. It says in Ephesians 2.2, 2, Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So he's the prince of the power of the air that we have. He's the God of this world. He's the prince of this world. No wonder he could say to Jesus, You fall down in your flesh right now, in your body and you worship me and I will give you all these things. So he had the keys and the power for a while. For a while. That's why it says again in John 12, 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. It's only for a while. He's the prince of the world, but guess what? The king is coming. Amen. And when the king comes, he's casting out that old rotten prince. But in the meantime, it's Satan who seems to be ruling this old world. It's Satan who seems to have all the control of the world. It's Satan who seems to be dictating all the things of this world. So we're talking about the offering of the temptations of all these things. The prize, what Satan wants, he'll offer you all these things if you'll just serve yourself. If you'll just serve you and not God. If you'll just fall down and worship him by worshiping yourself. His prize was worship and service. Let's don't give in to that temptation. But I know a lot of Christians who have. They're not involved in serving God. They're not walking with God. Why? Because Satan has offered them all these things if they would just worship the created creature instead of the Creator. So we find the prize is worship and, and service. We find Satan's proffer, his offer to us is, was valid. It was valid. He could do it for a while. But we find Satan's peaking was a shortcut. Satan's peaking was a shortcut. The word peaking there is, is just arousing, provoking, stirring, awaking. Like somebody's peaking in interest there. It's that arousing, that stirring. What, why in the world would, when Satan offers us all these things, what was it he was offering? What is it that stirs us up when he offers all these things? In the case of Christ here, he was offering a shortcut. He was offering a shortcut. In other words, he's saying to Jesus, you can get all the glory. Yeah, we know Jesus was going to have all the glory. Amen. He was going to go to the cross. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be beaten and spit upon, died, buried, and rose again. And for the glory, he says, but he said, you know what? Satan was saying, tell you what, you worship me and you can bypass the cross. You worship me. You don't have to worry about that, all this stuff. He said, you do it right now and I'll give you all the glory right now. All the glory you want right now. You can have the whole world's glory if you'll just fall down and worship me. He was basically offering him a shortcut. Never mind going to the cross. Never mind obeying God. No matter, no matter, don't bother that. He said, you can take a shortcut and get the glory now. You know how Satan tempts us today with all these things? He's tried to get us to take the shortcuts also. Are you listening? The shortcuts also. 
and tempts us. You don't need to commit to marriage to satisfy your flesh. Take the shortcut. You can have it now without marriage. You can have it now without the commitment. You can have it now. Just fall down and worship. You can get reward without work. Las Vegas is built upon that temptation. Don't worry about work. You can have fun and make lots of money. By the way, they didn't build all those buildings by giving you money. They make it. But the idea of shortcuts. How many things in our lives, that we, 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 that Satan would come and say, you've worshipped me, you do it my way, and say, so just never mind about the hard way, never mind about serving, never mind about sacrifice, never mind about holiness, never mind about righteousness. You can still give what you, I'll give you all these things if, if. Very quickly, Satan's promise was deceptive. Satan's promise was deceptive. As he offered Christ this, just like he offers us all these things, looking at all the kingdoms of the world, was deceptive. Say, so what are you talking about? Verse number 8, And again the devil taketh him into an exceedingly high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. He showed him the what class? Glory of them. He showed him the what? The glory of them. He only showed him the glory, not the gloom. He showed him the glitter, but not the gluttony. He only showed him the good things. How many know Satan will only show you the good things? The things that you want, the things you desire. He doesn't show you the bad. All the kingdoms. Yes, we look at the big cities. You look at San Francisco. From a distance, you look at San Francisco, and boy, it looks fantastic. It's so pretty there with that skyline there, and the bay right there, and the bridges right there. Oh, and all the, you say, boy, that's going to be an exciting place. What a glorious place. What a wonderful place. Until you get down in the city, and you step over the drug addicts, and you step over the mess, and you see all the immorality, and you see all the, all the perversion in the world. But so Satan, as he often for Christ, he said, look, I'll give you all this kingdom. Let me show you all the kingdoms and their glory, and you can have them. Satan does the same thing for us. He shows us the glory. His offer to you and I, we must understand this, he offers us all these things in the world, all the pizzazz, all the pleasures, if you will, all the glory, all the things that just would, we think would make us happy, it's deceptive. An example is, Alcohol. Heard a preacher not some time ago talking about beer commercials. They show you skinny, happy people with white teeth. <laughs> Say, yeah, that's for me. Boy, I'll be skinny, I'll be happy, I'll be good looking, and everything's going to be... Oh, but they don't show you that skid row. They don't show you the livers that have been destroyed. They don't show you the beaten women and wives and kids and abandoned families that it brings. Oh, the Satan's promises are deceptive. He said, you can have this, yes, but he won't show you what comes with this. He can have this glory, but he won't show you what comes with that glory. God's trying to help us understand these things because Satan comes to you and I and he says, you can have all these things, all these things, if you will just serve the creature, if you will fall down and worship me. Very quickly, I want you to notice overcoming the temptation of all these things. All the, he said, I'll give you all these things, which is just an accumulation of, of, the lust of, of the pride of life and the lust of the flesh and the, the lust of the eyes. It all accumulates in all these things. Overcoming the temptation of all these things. Here we go. This is how we do it as we see from the Scriptures. Number one, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the what class? Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. They are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. If you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So walk in the flesh and not fulfill the, walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you look back in verse number 1 of chapter 4, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, when it says, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He said, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It does not mean you will not be tempted. Are you listening to that? We'll still be tempted. But we don't, will not fulfill the lust 
of the flesh. That's why we're walking continually in the Spirit. Walk in the Holy Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Have the fruits of the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit control your lives. And when the temptation comes, you will not fulfill or satisfy the lust of the flesh. So let's learn to be filled with the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Listening to the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't grieve the Spirit. But follow and listen and walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill fill the lust of the flesh. Number two, wield the sword of the Spirit. Not just walk in the Spirit, but wield the sword of the Spirit. Again, we know this, but I wish we would believe it. When the devil came and tempted Christ, his answer was Scripture. Scripture. He said, it is written, and he quoted Scripture back to the devil. If you and I would learn that Scripture that we need for that temptation. Listen, whatever temptation you have, if it's, if it's greed, Learn some scriptures. If it's immorality, if it's lust, learn some scriptures. If it's the idea for gambling, learn some scriptures. If it's alcohol, learn some scriptures that deal with those things. And when the temptation comes, if you're serious, you can wield that sword of the Spirit the Bible gives us and wield it and fight the devil and fight the temptation and overcome the temptation of all these things by the sword of the Spirit. that we're talking about, you must first of all possess it. You've got to possess the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 17, we're talking about the armor of God. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're going to get victory over the temptation of all these things. It's available, but you've got to first possess it. You first must have it. That's what I'm talking about. I have hid thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You've got to have it in your heart. You've got to possess it. You can't have it on the coffee table. Well, there's the Bible. There's the word of the God. I guess it's going to defend me from temptation. No, not unless you possess it yourself and have it in your heart and know what you need. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 37, 31. The law of the Lord is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. God's telling us over and over, we've got to have this book in our heart. We've got to memorize it. We have to meditate on it. We have to know it so we can wield it when the Satan him comes with the temptation for all these things. We look at Christ. How in the world can we get overcome the temptation of all these things? Walk in the Spirit. Wield the sword of the Spirit. It means we need to possess it. Secondly, we have to prove it. We have to prove it. Not prove that it's true, but prove it so we can use it. So we can use it. We know the story of David when David was getting ready to go fight Goliath. And Saul says, well, all right, I'm going to give you my armor. And, of course, Saul was a head and shoulders above everybody else. He was a huge guy. And so David put on his armor, and he, he couldn't do it. In 1 Samuel 17, 9, 39, And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. For he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And we know that David then went and got a slingshot, and he used that slingshot with the five stones. How many believe he would have been better off if he could have used the sword? What did he do when he, after he defeated Goliath? He took the sword and chopped his head off. But David said, I can't use it. I've not proved this. I've not done it. In fact, from then on, David used swords. He learned how to use swords. He began, oh, I know how to use armor now. I know how to do this. And then he said, no, I've not proved it. He said, I've never used these. I've not used these swords. But when he learned how to use the sword, he started carrying swords around. <laughs> so Christians, we have to prove them. We have to have not just possess it, but we need to prove it. Take it into battle. Use it. I challenge, I challenge you that tonight or tomorrow, when that temptation comes, go ahead and learn to prove the sword of the Spirit. Go ahead and say, God, here's your verse. You've made this promise. This is your command. God, I'm going to use it, and I'm not going to let my mind go in that gutter. I'm not going to let my mouth go down to gossip. I'm not going to let my heart descend into that. I'm not going to be so lazy and not serve you. God, I'm going to listen. You take the sword of the Spirit and prove it. Use it and learn how to use it. Walk in the Spirit. He said, I'll give you all these things. No, I'm walking in the Spirit. I'm going to give you all these things. No, I'm going to wield the sword. I'm going to possess it, and I'm going to prove it. Then thirdly, holy worship the Savior. Holy worship the Savior. 
Again, look at verse number 10. Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Him only. The key is, if we commit to fully worshiping Christ, Fully worshiping God. There'll be no room for another. There'll be room. No, I'm fully worshiping Him. Him only. Him only. Him only. Not the creature, but the Creator. Him only. And Him only will I worship. And Him only will I serve. And when we're full of worshiping Christ, when we've magnified Him, when we've got that commitment, fullness of Him, there'll be no room to worship Him anybody else. But here's the problem. We've got about this much worship and about this much space and Satan comes to worship me and I'll give you all these things. Yeah, i got room. No, it ought to be. I've got no room. I've got no room. I've got no space for you. Get thee hence, Satan. Get thee. I've been preaching on Sunday mornings about choose God. Choose wisely. Choose God. There's the key. Holy worship the Savior. All these things, he said, I'll give you. I don't know what parts, you might say, well, I don't care much about that part, but this part over here, I sure lie. He said, I'll give it to you all. If, if, don't let him deceive you. Don't let him deceive you. Let's just worship God. Overcoming the temptation of all these things. Let's bow our heads, please.